When I was a young child, I visited a neighbor of my grandparents, and they had a pool. Oh, my. I did not have a pool in my yard, I can tell you. So I went over to the pool, and the kids that, that were there invited me to come into the water, so I did. But then they said, why don't you come on over to the deep end? Deep end meaning six foot or something along those lines. And I said, oh, no, I can't. I can't swim. See, it turns out I started taking swimming lessons in the little town of Chester where I grew up. But the chlorine in that pool bothered my eyes so terribly that my eyes swole up. It scared my mother, and she decided I couldn't have any more swimming lessons. So I um, made it to the point where I could float, and that was it. And I never was in deep water. So I told them I couldn't swim, but they said, hey, don't worry about that. They said, all you got to do is jump in. And you'll know what to do. You'll be able to swim. So I jumped in. And it didn't just happen, let's put it that way. I didn't just suddenly have the ability to swim. Instead, I sank. And, you know, when you don't know how to do anything in water, how you flail around and you actually make yourself heavier and you... That's what I was doing. I went down, and I went down again, and finally they came over and pulled me out, and I was terrified. And I've been terrified of deep water ever since, until I had some swimming lessons recently. Still can't swim very well, but if somebody threw me in the deep end, I'll tell you what, I could float to the other side. (laughs) On my back, of course. Deep water. That is what Jesus called Peter to do in our scripture passage for today. Peter was supposed to go back out and catch fish in deep water. So listen with me to our story today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, starting with the first verse. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genereset, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down And taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've been working all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. In our story for today, Jesus was using Peter's boat as a makeshift pulpit. Peter and his friends had gotten in, and their boat was sitting there. Of course, there were no fish in it because they didn't have any that they caught, but Jesus preached from the boat pulpit for a while. 
And then after he was done with that, he looked at Simon Peter and he said, take that boat out a little further. Get it, get it into the deep water. Now, first of all, try to imagine that you don't have a day job. You have a night job. Fish don't bite during the day, generally, at least not in the time of Jesus in that part of the country. And so they were out all night and they hadn't caught anything. So you've been up all night working and you're coming in. You don't have anything to eat because guess what? You didn't catch any fish. And so you're bringing that boat back into shore. And then here's Jesus standing there at the shore and he decides to teach for a while. And then while you're washing your nets, he wants you to go out again. Oh, my goodness. Ugh. You know, washing the nets, by the way, was absolutely vital. Because if they didn't wash their nets every single time they put their nets down into the water, those nets wouldn't be good for a year. They had to wash all that salt water out of there. And it took a long time. Peter is sitting there washing the nets probably while Jesus was teaching and he had finally finished them, and they were dry. Yes. This means he could go home and get some rest. But that's not how it turned out, because Jesus turned to Peter and said, take it out again, take it out again. I can almost hear Peter, you know, when I'm reading the scripture today. We have been out all night, that's when fish bite, and we have caught nothing, and you want us to go out there in the daytime when fish don't bite? All right, fine, we'll try. That's kind of the way I would be too, I think, if I was up all night. So he took the boat out, just like Jesus said, and down, down, down the nets went into the deep, 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 deeper water. And then up, up, up came so many fish, they couldn't even hardly drag the net into the boat. In fact, there was so much fish in there, it took two boats to carry them to shore, and those boats were breaking. Holy cow. This was enough fish for, for them to sell and eat for a long, long time. It was a wonderful gift. And you know what Peter did with that? He left it. He left all those fish there at the shore. And he left his boat, too. The one thing that he had in this world to make a living, he left that, too. Because when Peter saw that huge amount of fish, he suddenly realized something about who Jesus was. How do we know that? Because he fell on his face, like Isaiah in the other passage. And he said, oh, Jesus, stay, stay away from me. I'm a sinful man. That really means that he recognized that Jesus was someone who wasn't like others. He was divine. He was beyond. And Peter wasn't. And so he was on his face on the ground. He saw a glimpse of who Jesus was. And then he walked away. You know, the first time I felt called to ministry, um, I felt pretty foolish. I, was, I had felt that way for a while, you know, the sense, the stirring thing that goes on. And I was afraid to tell anybody because I thought it would sound crazy. I was almost 50 years old. I was at the top of my game. I was secure. I had friends. I had a wonderful home. I loved Chicago. And I couldn't get any rest from this thing, this stirring. So finally, I told my home church pastor. 
And I thought she would be very encouraging, you know, Um, because she was always very encouraging to me about everything so far. But when I told her I thought I sensed a call to ministry, a very serious look crossed her face. I'll never forget that look. It just changed in an instant. And she said, Karen, don't do that unless there is nothing else in this world you can do. And she went on to say, ministry will dig into the deepest parts of your life and it will leave no stone unturned. Now, this was not what I was expecting, you know. I thought we were going to have a little celebration that day. So I just decided not to believe her. And in fact, I went home and I did start telling other people that I thought I was called to ministry. And I also said things like, you know, now that I can be home and I don't have to fly out every Monday morning and put in 12-hour days and then fly back every Friday, I think I'm going to take up serious gardening. I know I'm going to have a lot more time as a minister. What do ministers do anyway? They just preach on Sunday. What's that? I mean, how hard could that be? And then they visit the sick. I'm going to have plenty of time. This is going to be a lot easier. <laughs> right. Turns out my home church pastor, she was right. As soon as a person goes into ministry, they go from shallow water to deep, deep water. So today, <clears throat> I want to share with you some of the things that my net has caught in that deep, deep water since I went into ministry. It has not been an easy journey. I have not had more time. All the things I thought were what it was going to be like were were not what it turned out to be like. And as it turns out, my home church pastor, mm, she was right about that too. So... When you're called to something, and it doesn't have to be ministry, it could be anything. You could be called to something tomorrow. Something that you sense that I really need to do this. It's a, it's a very distinct feeling when you realize I'm the person, I'm here, I see this need, I've got to do something. So, And that happens to all of us a lot of days of our lives. And ministry was no different than that, except it was kind of bigger and longer. So the very first step is yes. You know, when Peter, Jesus asked Peter to put his net out, and Peter goes, oh, man, I don't really want to do this. But if you say so, I'll put it out. That's kind of how I felt. I was excited. However, basically, turns out I wanted to stay home. I figured I could stay home. Why not? There's a seminary right here, but it turns out that the seminary that offered me a full scholarship for everything, tuition, housing, and all that, was in Louisville. Oh, yeah. So this meant I had to sell my house, and I had to leave everyone I knew, and I had to go to a strange place and start. It all begins with a yes. Yes. So if you decide you want to say yes to something, especially if God's calling you to do it, whether it's big or small, just remember, after you say yes, the matter is really kind of out of your hands. And Jesus will take it where it needs to go. That was my first lesson. Second lesson that I got was the first time I preached a sermon. I thought I did okay. You know, it was very hard to go up there the first time. But... My mentor Morgan was there. It's the very first time I preached a sermon in my very first church, in my very first year of seminary. And so we're walking out toward the car, and he says, that was pretty good. He said, but, but, I always hate those buts. You know what they say about but? Everything that comes before it isn't, just ignore that. Only pay attention to what's after the but in the sentence. (laughs) And it was true of Morgan. He said, You must free yourself from the manuscript. Oh, goodness. I looked at him and I thought, 
Are you crazy? I'm going to be up preaching every week for years, and I'm not going to have a man. I didn't say this out loud, of course. I just said to myself, like when my home church pastor talked to me, oh, that's not true. But then, about three weeks later, I went down for another field ed church in Birmingham, Alabama. And after I preached one Sunday, <clears throat> one of the uh, older ladies who Morgan had told me, this, this is person is a saint, you've got to listen to her. She's really a saint. She, and I, of course, was still reading from my manuscript. I hadn't reformed or anything. And she just came up to me and she said, Karen, she's kind of patting me on the shoulder, you know. Karen, I like to hear you preach, but mostly I want to see your eyes. I thought, my eyes? Why would anybody want to see my eyes? See, she didn't want me to be looking down. She wanted me to be looking out like I'm looking at you today. That was the first time I realized just how detrimental a manuscript can be. Because you can't, we can't look into each other's eyes. You know how important? Look into each other's eyes. I mean, this is a real treat. And so I thought, well, I've just got to do something about this. But the lesson I learned was simply this. People who are listening to me when I'm in front here, you want to know something about me, right? You want to know, do I believe this stuff? You, you want to be able to look in my eyes and somehow sense who I am. You want to connect with me. And that was the second lesson. That everyone wants to connect. We all want to connect every day. But particularly, you want to connect with me as a minister. And I want to connect with you. That was my second lesson. The third lesson I had was at the first called church that I went to, and that was a very, very difficult church. Early on while I was there, I <clears throat> invited uh, several people to come over to my house. I, I had to have a meal with me, you know, and I would prepared it. And guess what? Not one person showed up. Nobody said anything about it. And I sat there that night and I looked at that food and I cried myself to sleep. And nobody even acted like I had even made an invitation. And that was just the beginning. <clears throat> As the days and weeks and years went by, I heard painful, cruel things being said about me, second and third hand, all the time, almost every day. And then the church stopped paying me. So that went on for a number of months before the presbytery stepped in to correct that problem. And by the time that happened, I was just worn out. I, I was to a point where I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I, I knew I was failing. And I had never failed like that before. Not only was I failing, I was falling because I was so tired and I couldn't keep it up. And I wanted to quit. And I told the Presbytery, I want to quit. But then people came in. People who lived in the community, other ministers from other churches, they gathered around me. They listened to my story. They gave me support. The Presbytery gave me support. They lifted me up and kept me up high enough that I was able to stay and leave. Third lesson, surround yourself with loving support. It doesn't matter what you're doing or what you're facing in your life. Surround yourself with loving support. You know, not a single one of us would be here today. We wouldn't even be alive if, 
it weren't for the love of God and the love of people who supported us to the point where we could be sitting here today. We're not here to go it alone. We never have been here to go it alone. That was my third lesson. You see, ministers are wounded healers. So there is a lot of things that a pastor has to carry. I know more than I'd ever want to know. I experience things, more things than I've ever wanted to experience, really. But there's some buried gift in that. There is an opening of compassion that comes from sharing difficult times with people. And that was my fourth lesson. Let the wounds open. Let God heal them. Don't let things that are hard harden you. Don't. Yes, I have to keep my heart open to you. But that also means, and I'm a public person, so everything I do, you see, you can evaluate, whatever. But that doesn't mean that I can harden my heart and try to protect myself. Otherwise, I will not be a pastor. And now I come to my fifth lesson, the one I learned with you. I am continuing to learn with you. I've learning all these lessons all along. But the one that has been foremost here has been the lesson about differences. You know, I came here about three or four weeks after President Obama was elected. And after that moment, our world, if it, our world has been going in the direction of violence for many, many years. But around the time I came here, we, st- we started actually going off the cliff. And there were violent episodes and children killed in, in schools and people killed in churches. And it's been so, so hard. But it's not just been hard out there. It's been hard in here because we don't all agree Isn't that amazing? But we're not the only ones that don't all agree. Our whole country is like that. And so now we are are in positions where it's so, so hard to disagree with one another. We don't even want to start the conversation because we know we can't get out of it. And because we are more and more taking our places, our positions, opposing one another, we're talking less and less. You know, I've probably been afraid of anger for most of my life, for a whole variety of reasons. But here, with you, I have learned that anger has a place and that we should be communicating even if we disagree, especially if we disagree, because if we don't, how are we ever going to come together again and be God's people, all of us? How are we going to do that if we don't talk? Oh, and it's so, so very hard. But you know, not one single one of us is a bundle of positions and beliefs. We are human beings first. We can place some of that aside. We can. We have to choose to. But it's very important that we make that choice because our whole faith tradition is based on community. Community. We are not here to go it alone. We're here to be together. And that's the lesson I've learned here at First Presbyterian Church. You know, ministry is amazing. In a single week, I can go through the entire lifespan. I can sit with the dying, baptize the newly born. I can join together two people in marriage who want to start a new journey together. 
I can sit with people who are ill. I can pray for healing. I can do all of this, and on a few occasions, in just one week. It's like living your whole life in some kind of condensed version and doing it over and over and over again. That's what ministry is like, and that's what's wonderful about it. Because I get to be present with you in the important times when it really matters. And I don't have to be right. I don't have to be strong. All I have to be is me with you and God. This, this is a privilege. Ministry is a whole journey of second chances. And you have a journey of second chances too, just by living your lives. You can decide that one moment at a time is enough. That you're not going to worry about yesterday or what's going to happen. You're just going to take this one moment at a time, just the way it's given to us. You can do that. You can learn to trust God more and more. You can learn to lean more and more on each other for support and comfort. And you can give your life away in love to the world that's hurting so desperately, to your families. That's the greatest gift. You know, when Peter recognized who Jesus was that day, and he fell on his face, he knew he was going to leave everything behind. And he did. He went on an adventure with Jesus. And I can tell you today that that adventure with Jesus is the most thrilling thing you'll experience in your life.